objects and you win on merit without going to see anybody. This is what the law provides. Then came the procurement law. So, December 2023, with the president's president assent in 205, and the objectives are known by everybody. There's harmony in the public procurement processes, and now we have secured the judicious, economic, and efficient use of state resources. The law has been in operation for, when I say the law, the act initially was Act 663. And after 10 years of operation, there were a lot of challenges identified by practitioners. And they have been amended into the Amendment Act 914. So now we use both as the public procurement law. So this is just by way of introduction, how the law has come to be. And this law is binding to the extent that you are using public funds to undertake public procurement, you are using guaranteed loans, you are using grants by government. So it's not just um, the, the public funds, but even if government secures a loan, it comes under the application of this law. So as practitioners, if somebody tells you he's going to do a project, and he engages your services, you work, you work, you work, and you don't go through the process. You have problems when it comes to payment. The audit people will query it. Where is the approval for this? Did you go through this? They will not pay. So it's very important that you ensure that the law has been complied with in undertaking assignments. I said we have different considerations when you find yourself in the public or private spaces. So this law applies to public procurement. Private procurement agencies like, um, let's say, APSA Bank, they have their own set of rules that you follow when you're undertaking procurement. But those are private. They don't necessarily have to come under this law. But they have processes that you need to follow all ensuring value for money, as it were, with those agencies. So if you are working for a private person, you don't necessarily have to use these laws. But for public projects, public procurement law applies. So we are saying that the essence of this law is that for the public sector, it is for public good. The reason why we have different considerations is that public sector procurement is to ensure public good. Public good, we can decide that the government is going to build a stadium. It's a public good. So not necessarily making profits. But the private sector, the primary objective is to make profits. Even with this difference, it tells you that they will have different considerations. So to the extent that they want profits, they are very um, amenable to changes. They can use any procedure or very fast way of achieving their aim because they are looking at profits. That is why I always set this example. At the ministries, those of you who know the operations of the ministries very well, people come to the ministries and decide that today I'll photocopy a textbook for my son. Right? So if you sell a product to the ministries or government agencies, that will keep those practices, it will be resisted. In the private space, they have put in systems whereby it's very difficult to do some of these things because they're looking at profits, right? And because of that, it is very important that wherever you find yourself, you know how they operate and how you also work with them. In both cases, they're all trying to provide value for money and being accountable for spending decisions and then adhering to their policies. This table summarizes it all. In the public space, they have larger groups of stakeholders to report to, including taxpayers, clients, and vendors. So public procurement, that's why you say they are taking it to the next level, a committee should meet on it. You have to be accountable. Practitioners deal with an increased level of red tapes and rules which must be adhered to. So a reason why the CEO will have to seek approval from the ETC 
if the threshold is higher, you go to the other higher body central or the regional bodies for approval before you can proceed. That is public space for you. Greater emphasis on following policy and acting transparently. It has to be a transparent process because anybody can challenge it as a citizen. Those of you listening to the news yesterday, you've heard the games that the executive and the legislature are playing. Yes. It's very important that you are very transparent in all you do. Seen as a routine, operational, transactional, and almost a means to an end, highly regulated, and sometimes can be seen as inflexible. Yes. Without a process, you cannot proceed. Gaining consensus rather than wielding authority. So if you're head of an agency and you think that you want the job to go to your friend, you don't go wielding authority. Talk to the people who you work with, build consensus, and then let them understand why you think somebody else can do the job and not the other. And then there are limitations on negotiations. No leniency and no flexibility apart from clarifications. If you know the procurement processes, um, you cannot just say somebody should um, do the work at X amount. You need to go through a process, seek approval to under section 64 to even negotiate. It's not straightforward that you negotiate. Private sector will do things easily. I recall at the point, um, I think, Barclays Bank at the time, they had a lot of outlets, um, units across the country. I think in the era of one lady, they opened up a lot of branches. They couldn't have done that easily with a public sector approach. But private sector decided that our partners on firms and they let them build these things. As long as they follow their policies, they're okay. So these are the differences you need to appreciate. Practitioners must be more agile for the private. Agile and able to respond to change quickly. So if there's any change, there was a solution that was sold to the ministry. They didn't buy but the private sector just rolled on. If you want to network all your um, IT staff and then you monitor the printing of documents, who prints and what quantities they print, and then they give it to a private vendor who will just come install your machines and at the end of the day, they'll charge you per number of sheets printed. That's a private sector for you. They'll easily agree on that because it can make them more efficient. Private sector, they are very open for any innovative idea that will make their profit generation go high. Constrained by meeting cost reduction targets, recognizes value and strategic benefits that procurement can bring to the organization, more flexible to innovations, profit and people oriented, respect to enterprising and technical dynamics in its corporate culture. They offer contractor freedoms and opportunities. So when I say contractor freedoms, you understand from the procurement systems. They can decide to do partnering. They have a relationship with somebody that they sign on to give some service to the next five years because for them, it's good for them, they are making profit, but public space is difficult to nail a contract like that. So this is the differences. And one thing I do, or I challenge the Institute of Architects to do is that they normally ask for our questions before we even come here to lecture. This year I've told them that I'll do this before because I want to relate to the participants and know what kind of questions you want to ask I don't believe in asking questions before you come and lecture. So note this very well. If you are asked to get the differences in the both spaces, you should understand what it is. Then there's this value of competition. Um, private sector can benefit from the value of competition that a public sector promotes. Public sector, everything is about competition. Competition. Private may not necessarily compete to the extent that they think that your solution is good. So when you have competition, it enables the discovery of what of different and diverse supplies that a procurement or a purchaser may not have known were available. So when you open up the competition, you see new products and new ideas on the market. Otherwise, if you are fixated on working with two or three people, when new things or new ideas come, you don't benefit from it. And in competitive purchasing process, vendors can put their best foot forward. That means they give competitive prices because He's competing. Then, from innovation also, the public from the private. Um, they can adopt policies in line with the public sector procedures to promote efficiency arising out of innovations. I think an example I just cited, centralized printing, adherence to timelines, thereby reducing bureaucratic bottlenecks. So, the public can also benefit from the innovative ideas of the private sector. 
Now let's get to the structures under the Public Procurement Act. I carefully put the 663 first so that you know where we have come from before we amended to 914. So the 663 procurement entity. What is a procurement entity? ECG is a procurement entity. VRA is a procurement entity. Ghana Water is a procurement entity. To the extent that they have autonomy of spending and they have been declared as such by the PPA. So if the PPA, sorry, if you so wish to be declared a procurement entity, you can apply to PPA and, and they can advise Minister of Finance to declare your procurement entity. That is why at the point the sole commissioner was declared a procurement entity so that he'll be able to spend. So the declaration lies with the public procurement authority who advises the finance minister for an agency to be declared procurement entity. And um, there is a challenge with some agencies. Uh, those of you know the University of Education, Winneba. They have campuses from Winneba Head Campus. They have Kumase and they have Mampong. But the UCEW is the entity. So they operate from Winneba and take decisions for the other campuses. And it's a challenge working for any of those two um, sub-campuses because everything has to go to Winneba for approval. So at a point, Kumasi, for example, was pushing to be declared an entity. They didn't understand why they have a professor vice chancellor like Winneba has. They have a way they generate their own money, and yet somebody has to take decisions for them. So they try to apply for consideration for being a procurement entity. So that's how it is done. And then beyond the entity, we have the Entity Tender Committee. So the Entity Tender Committee, like I said, I would narrow down on what they do. But from this section, they review procurement plans in accordance with the objectives of the entity, ensure spending within available budget, refer to appropriate tender reviews for approval above their threshold, and then they meet periodically. So if you have an agency like, say, Ghana Water Company Limited, the head of entity is the chief executive. Entity. Of course, you and I know that if you are evaluating proposals that involves architectural designs and what have you, you cannot put an accountant or a pharmacist on the panel. So the practice was that some agencies, especially the investors, because of allowance, they had some people who were always on the ATC. So when they are doing procurement, the same people. Construction, the same people. Furnishing, the same people. But the law says this is an ad hoc committee. So you form the evaluation panel consistent with the kind of procurement you are doing. That's what the law provides. Refrain from use of standing evaluation committees or panel for all types of procurement. So that's clear. And then we have the tender review boards. Under 663, noted very well, we had tender review boards. So we had a central, ministerial, regional, and district. 
So they all deal with thresholds. When I say thresholds, it is the amounts that they are considering for approval. So the district had a list, then the regional, ministerial, and then central. Central had the highest. And central receives documents from, or then receive documents from the whole country. So you can be in Bagabaga District Assembly, and you bring your documents central to the extent that the amount you're asking for is within the threshold of the central. That was how 663 operated. If you have questions, kindly ask as I go along. And the, what the work of the review, tender review boards was that they review the activities at each step of the cycle. So they start from your planning. Do you, do you have budget for it? Did you advertise it? If you did not, did you seek approval for the use of a less competitive method from PPA? They inspect all these things and then they now go into the details. How many people responded to the tender? Among the people who responded, um, did they provide all the requirements? If some people have been taken out, what was the basis? Is it fair with the law? They go through all this before they agree to the recommendation that you have made for the job to go to Mr. X or Mr. Y. So at a glance, this is it. So the head of entity has the least amount. And when you go to the subsequent tables, you see the amounts. So as a head, the amount within your threshold, you don't need to go to anybody. You can just approve for the contract to be placed. But that is not to say that you don't have follow procedures. You still have to follow procedures, whether it is um, price quotation you used, whether it is restricted tender you used, open tender you used. You have to go through all. But if the recommendation is made, the head can approve the amount within his threshold. And if it gets beyond that, you go to the entity tender committee. That's a bigger group, like I said, comprising maybe the head of finance, blah, blah, with people from outside forming the ATC above the threshold of the. Then we come to the districts in case of the decentralized agencies. Ministerial also had their threshold. So the ministries. Every ministry had a ministry attend review. So it depends on the amount. That committee also sits and approve before you can place a contract. So there's this thing that people misunderstood that um, the review bodies awarded contracts. No. Declared the processes by granting concurrent approval. The emphasis is on concurrent approval. You concur to the award recommendation before you. And without concurrence, no agency can grant approval for award of contract. So if an agency, without going through the processes, gives you an award letter, it could be challenged, or you cannot have payments until you have concurrence from the approving authority so prescribed by the law. So over 10 years, there were a lot of problems. One of them was with the ministerial. And you know how Ghana will operate. If the minister travels, nothing happens. So they had problem with quorum. Most of the time, the minister is not there, somebody is not there, and they will pile up the documents for a long time. They will sit once and say, we are giving them treaty approval. So they were not very critical. So it was one of the challenges that came with 663. So 914 came to quash the ministerial. So if you look at the law as it exists now, the amended law, we don't have ministerial review. And also, one of the challenges was that if you look at an agency like GMPC, and look at an agency like National Teaching Council, they operate on different levels and thresholds. If you look at GMPC, if they have to delay for two days, the cost of a rig on the shore could be millions of Ghana cities. So their spending requirements were very high. Meanwhile, 663, we operated with the same threshold for everybody. So we decided that let's now categorize the entities according to their spending capacities. Okay? So that those who spend high can have a lot more flexibility without delays. Then those who spend low can easily also go. So we have now categorized the entities into categories A to F. So at a glance, you see the Legislature, Judiciary Council of the Bank of Ghana as category A. 
and B is the independent constitution bodies, central management bodies, ministry, state owned, regional coordinating, statutory farm manager. So the Senate and all those are all here, all the SOEs are all here. So that constitutes category A and B who have the same threshold of spend. Category C, head of servant agencies and government departments, teaching hospitals, tertiary institutions. So Legon, UST, and Co are at category C. And even that, I can tell you now that it's still a challenge because the kind of projects they do, when you look at just a simple administration block, it falls into the spend of category A, but they have to come to C. So it's also very difficult. Every little thing they have to come, but if you open up, they are able to do things on their own. On the other hand, the argument is that if some agents don't have the capacity to spend, and then you also give them a very high threshold, the tendency is that they create problems. Because um, they can approve at their level. So, and you know, the bigger the amount, the bigger the waste. So if you have 20 million and you want to waste some money, you can easily waste 2 million. But when you have 200,000, here can you waste? 20,000 is far less as compared to like 2 million. So that is what guided this categorization. D is the regional offices, and then E is the district offices in that order. And then this time, they decided that they would treat the assemblies, metropolitan and municipal assemblies, differently from the other structure. So that's category F. When I say differently, the category F Metropolitan assemblies, municipal and assemblies, they now report to a different review body. All the others, A to E, when they have figures above their threshold, they go to the Central Tender Review Committee, which I work for, and category F, because at the district level, you don't expect them to come to a crowd all the time. So they now use the regional review committees. I hope I'm clear. The districts, municipal and metropolitan as authorities or assemblies, when they have considerations above their threshold, they seek concurrent approval from the regional, respective regional review board. So voter will go to voter, is to go to Easton. That is it. But all other agencies, to the extent that you are spending public money, you come to central. Clear. There was also recomposition of the membership of the ETCs. There was this interesting scenario under 663, whereby by the composition of the membership of the ETCs, the vice chancellors didn't have a seat on the ETCs. Imagine that the law says spending responsibilities lie with the head of agency, that's if you're a vice chancellor. And yet, per the constitution, the vice chancellor was not a member of the ATC. So somebody will go and sit down and take decision for you and you become responsible. So these were some of the anomalies that we, we try to address in the membership composition. And I think for the universities, they have now even brought in the reps from the SRC. We all re recorded this in the university. When the SRC people were so powerful, they can challenge decisions of vice chancellor, what have you. But now they are brought, brought in as members of the ATC so that if decisions are taken, they cannot come back and blame management. So you see, 663, for example, first had a council chair to be the head of the ETC. Who knew the council chair for UST? The Before Otto Shibo. The two for himself was there. So do you expect the two for to come and sit in an ETC meeting? Or if you will not have time to sit in an ETC meeting. So now it's been amended for the vice chancellor himself to chair the ETC. So these were some of the things that an I one for try to address. At a glance, these are the thresholds. You don't need to Keep this in your head. The act is there, you can always, it's a manual that you practice with, so you can always refer to it. So you look at goods. So the categories are here. The categories that we just went through. A and B, goods, works, and services. 
So if you are doing any of them, goods, works, or services, these are the amounts. And this is category F, those who are going to the regional reviews. These are the amounts. So the moment you cross this amount, you know that you have to seek approval from the next approval authority. Head ETC Regional. Head ETC Central for them. I hope you are good with the structures. So if you are asked a question, and the question will not come in the form that what is the threshold of this? No. You, you'll be given a scenario whereby you are advising a client processes to follow to secure approval before a job is placed. You should be able to understand. Nobody will tell you that um, you have to go through the regional or central. The name of the client will be mentioned. So you should have to place it rightly that it is an SOE or a judicial assembly for which you go here. So that is how we tease our professional you are given the scenario, you read very well, and then you know how to advise a client. Because at this stage, you are all professionals, you are going to advise. And if you give wrong advice, you know what it means. The client believes in you, he thinks that he's going to talk to his board and management that he has a, an architect who is the lead of a team and who will be able to advise him appropriately. And then you are given a case scenario, you should be able to tease out the issues and advise appropriately. Now, procurement is about planning. So, um, I just want to get a clarification on the authority of the review bodies. So, what if, let's say you have a donor, a donor who is sponsoring a project, and then you have to go and seek approval. Do you seek approval from both the review committee and then the donor or I want to understand how that is. Okay, very good question. So, it's good that we at the end of the day touch on um, the donor funded thing. Under section 96 of the law, we call it international obligations. When you have donors who are sponsoring projects, two things. Some of them agree for you to use commercial agreements which are different from the law. So, you don't need to go through the law. Others would want to also use the country systems. For example, now the World Bank uses country systems. So World Bank projects, they ask you to come through, especially when they are doing post-review. We, we have prior review and post-review. Prior review is that they review before you can proceed, but post is that go through all your country systems, everything. At a point, they will come and then flip through the documents, take some out, and then check whether we are very compliant with our own processes. So it depends on what you are dealing with. But generally, the, the donors, most of the donors insist that you use your country because they, they have trust in our system. They think we've been around for some time and I mean, it's, it's, it's fairly served our purpose. So that's how it operates. Now, planning. Okay. Please, I just want to clarify. So the, the hierarchy you showed before under the 663 that had like the entity regional, da 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 da. Does it mean that under the 914, we scrapped all that, and then when we categorize them, just who they report to is who they report to? All right. Thank you very much. So 663, like I said, had issues. So we scrapped them. Now we don't have the ministry, we don't have the district. We have the ETC, and then we have central, ETC and regional, depending on A to E and then F. So now we don't use, there's no district review, there's no ministerial review. Right? Can we proceed? Okay. So there's a saying that if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Procurement is about planning. In fact, if you decide that you, you are going to build, the reason why somebody will come to you as an architect to design is that he wants to plan. He wants to have a functional facility. So he wants to see you and then you put things in place for him. And the reason why a government will go through process of tendering is that he wants to plan everything. So if procurement, you don't plan, there's a problem. So have you, how many of you have seen a procurement plan before? 
a spreadsheet, a typical programming plan. You mention the activity or package number. You look at the estimated amount. You look at the processes that you follow before you get where you seek a route for the amount to guide you. So it's something that the procurement officers work with. And it makes you clearly understand the process and time frames required for any procurement activity. So from here, try and get a hold of a procurement plan and see what the fields provide. So contract packages, estimated costs, procurement method, processing steps. So in the plan, you see the procurement method. So if I always argue that if I am sitting at PPA, if you apply for the use of restricted tendering or single source, I will ensure that it's in your plan already before you ask for it. Because you all know the rampant use of these methods. Quickly, it's as if um, some people are the, they, they have the singular preserve for certain jobs. Any job, they'll put two, three, four together, and then they'll go apply for rest restricted tendering. So if you don't know somebody, you don't find your name there. And it's not helping us. We are not building uh, companies. Because the person has no incentive to build capacity and compete on a fair basis. To the extent that he knows a politician and he always have his name under some short list and then it will be approved. And it's even worse with a single source. So it's very important that every procurement is planned. And contract packaging, you determine the scope and then the phases of the projects. And the law under 663 originally frowned upon um, when you try to divide procurement parts into many with the hope of trying to swerve the, um, the scrutiny of a higher body. For example, um, let's say you are laying the pipelines from your office here to Dansoman. It's a huge project, right? It has to pass through a lot of areas, lane of pipelines. Maybe it could cost, let's say, 20 million Ghana cities. Clearly, that amount will take you to the approval threshold of central because anything about 50 million works will have to go to central. So the person sees 20 million and he, he doesn't want to go under scrutiny of central. So he will now do it lot one from here to um, Parliament House, lot two, Parliament House to finance lot, uh, and then all will be within some small threshold so that the head of entity can approve all. The law frowned upon that subdivide into parts so that you don't come under the scrutiny of. Then, estimated costs of contract packages. Here, I blame my colleagues, prof um, professional candidates of years. And I blame my own Ministry of Finance that I work for. How many of you have witnessed um, budget defense at the Ministry of Finance before? So, as a country, it's sad that most of us in the space who understand the practice, we don't find ourselves at certain places. So the people at Ministry of Finance are mostly accounting, economic people. I can tell you that for the past 17 years, I've been the only one so we are working for Ministry of Finance. So what they do is that when agencies take their budgetary considerations there, they will sit and say, okay, you have reduced this by this, you have cancelled this by this, but you have looked at what you want to do. You want to build an admin block. You know the total flow area and you have an idea of the cost you are putting there. They'll slash it. No scientific basis whatsoever. So that's the amount you have to work with. So you ask yourselves, if you are developing a procurement plan, is your estimated costs based on realistic pricing? Are your designs accurate enough for you to even come up with a realistic estimate? And here to the architects. Detailing is a problem. I, I still practice very well, and at times you have some drawings from architects and you wonder whether they want you to give approximate estimates or accurate estimates. They don't go into details. And for now, most architects have even left specifications to quantity of years. Your drawing should come with specifications. I have to understand what you want to specify for each of the elements. But they just leave it to chance. So in doing the abuse of quantities, we are forced to now generate specifications for both of the items. It's, it's, that is what it is. 
So without the details, it's very difficult to determine costs on a scientific basis. And that's where all our problems start. So you have a small amount of money. So you place the contracts, you go on tender, and from day one, the tender figures you are hearing are far higher than what you are putting in your budget. So some client will tell you that, can we do facing? And when you go through review, we will ask you, you have 10 million and you are committing 50 million. The funding gap, where do you get money from? Either you decide to face it or something. So this is where our problem starts. Procurement planning, realistic pricing, very important. Procurement method. At the time you are planning, you should have an idea of the method you want to use. If the job is said that the conditions in the law allows you to use restraint and bring, so be it. Put it there. If it is a proprietary item, national security concerns, for which reason you want to use single source, put it in your plan. Otherwise, the default is competitive method all the time. I told you the benefits of competition. So we always go competitive method. And you can also use international competitive tendering, ICT. If you deem it that the works is like that, you cannot have local capacity to do it, use international. And here, there's one thing that I always draw the attention of practitioners. Section 44 talks about national competitive tendering. 45 talks about international competitive tendering. And if you go to the thresholds in the law, it gives thresholds for international and national. You may be misled into using only the thresholds to determine that jobs that have this threshold should go to ICT. But you always have to combine the section provision with the threshold. It is only when you cannot have local competition that you go international. Just don't be guided by the threshold amount. Because by so doing, we are giving all the jobs to our foreigners. And you know the minutes of Chinese taking over our construction industry. Yes. So you, when you have a job, you just work to a bank. You take a facility at 32%, and you'll be working for towards that to pay. The Chinese government has released a lot of contractors in our system. They have equipped them, given them capital to work. So he comes, he can price very low because equipment is spreading over years to repay. You can never compete with them. So if we are not conscious of helping our own people, we will never get the jobs to our people. And we can't build capacity. It's a shame that after independence, this year witnessed one of our own being given a job on the motorway. Otherwise, <laughs> it would have been said that even motorway construction, we have to bring foreigners to do it. This is the only year that the board decision has been taken to give the motorway construction to a local firm. So we are not building capacity as a country, and it's a shame. Processing steps and types. If you are developing a procurement plan, you should understand that advertisement will take minimum X period. If you take an advert to graphic corporation, two weeks' time is when it will come, depending on it. So you plan all your procurement plan steps and times, the period for which you do evaluation has to be allowed for in the plan. If the threshold is like that, you go for approval from, let's say, central or um, regional, you have to look at the, their operating periods and allow for time that they will possibly approve. So you have an idea of when you start a project. And the planning will now influence you whether you should use um, open, restricted, or what have you. So procurement plan is an art. The planning is an art that needs thorough thinking through. You just don't draw a plan like that. You should understand the processes practically, what they mean to you in terms of the time and processing steps before you have a plan. And procurement starts with plan. If you bring any requests, we we'll inspect your plan. And the plan will tell us that whether you have provided adequately for it, you have a budget for it, before approval is granted. Without a plan, we will not even look at your requests. The general rules, procurement planning process to be fully integrated with applicable budget processes. So we encourage agencies that um, the amounts they allow for, they should make sure that it is consistent with the budget that they've been assigned by the ministry. So if, 
for example, Ghana Water, you've been given 20 million to spend as a, for the year. And we see your plan, and your plan is more than that. There will be a, a question. There are times we've even gone beyond that by asking very discretional questions. Um, an agency had X amount to spend, and he used 60% to buy a Mercedes Benz for the chief executive. This is questionable. Yes. No, that is how we operate as a country. So the CEO desires that he will drive this particular car, and he puts the money meant for the operational activities of the agency to purchase a vehicle for himself. And the land cruises you see around, if you look at that and you look at considerations for staff, for some agencies, it's, it's killing. So these are things that at times you are forced to ask, depending on how critical it is. So over the period, you are trying to now marry the financial um, management regulations with the Procurement Act by asking very pertinent questions. So, like what you said, the thresholds, do they come with like caveats for sections that apply to it? So, if let's say you have the 20, does it say maybe this amount is allowed for works, this amount is allowed for services, sections like that? No. So, before you are given an amount, as an agency, you first of all send your budget. That's why I asked who have been at budget defense before. You prepare your own activities and corresponding budgets for approval. And I will say each agency's own is a wish list. You wish that you had done all this. But you come to finance and the finance will say, this is how much I have available. So you go back and then you reassign and know what and what you're doing. Depend on your priorities. Okay, let me tell you this also. So there's also a banter between the management of agencies and the boards. The role of governing boards is that they approve programs of entities. So if you hear board chairman with board members of, let's say, GMPC, they approve general programs. These are the programs I want to do. And then when the programs are approved, management now drills down and look at the activities under the programs and put costs to them before they go to the ITC for approval. So what happens is that some board chairs by way of clouds are very powerful. And the board, if you are a CEO and you are not that strong, the board chair would run the organization for you. And we've seen a lot of examples. Some board chairs even have offices at the premises of the agencies, which is not allowed in governance system. You are board chairman, you come for your periodic meetings and you go, you advise on policies, you look at trends, what's happening. But some board chairs have permanent seats at agency offices. And I know some board chairs that day-to-day -day activities are sent to their homes for them to critique and approve or what have you, these things. And it's all about clouds. For instance, let me be a bit personal here. If you have a board chair who is very overbearing, he has a clout in, let's say, a political party, he has the ears of the president, and you are a chief executive, definitely you cannot stand up to him. When he says this, you only have to oblige, because he has the ears of the president and can. That is the practical issue here. So I just brought in that example because I want you to understand that the programs are different from the activities. You are confused. When I say programs, maybe this year we want to um, build our head office. We want to train our staff. We want to buy or replace the vehicles of the three top management staff. These are programs that you want to do as an agency. The board says, okay, fine. Like GMPC, we want to develop um, one of our oil fields. It's a program that the board has approved for it to be done. But how do you do them? So now management will now come and draw down and say, okay, these are the activities that we need to do to be able to do this. And they'll put that, convert it in a, into a procurement plan, assign budgets and the steps that they need to follow. It's approved by the ATC. And then the implementation is done by management. That's the head of agency and his team. It's not done by the board. The board sits at the top, having approved the program. They can only come for meetings and want to inspect progress. What are the challenges? Are there um, things that we need to know? But they don't look at the day-to-day -day implementation. Some board people want to even know who the job goes to. They want to influence it. That is the practical issue I'm talking about here. So, general rules 
head of department unit projects and programs are required to ensure the analysis and preparation of annual procurement plans for their own areas of control. So if you're a procurement officer and you are putting a procurement plan and you sit in your office alone and you just put the X amount, this, this, you have challenges. Talk to the user departments, IT department, um, transport, and then get their input into your plan because they understand what they want. Else, you end up going to buy a computer that will not serve the purpose because the IT people should know the specs they want. Transport officers should be able to give an input in the vehicles because they know the performance, the maintenance history and expectations. So before you do a procurement plan, bring all the departments on board, get their inputs, their buy-in before you send it for approval and subsequent implementation. I hope that's clear. It's like at the district assemblies, you know, we have district engineers. And there's also some um, turf war between the district engineers or construction operatives and the procurement officers. They feel the procurement officers are supposed to be coordinating the procurement function. So you don't allow a procurement officer who is a good trained person to prepare bills of quantities or to prepare designs. But the district engineers have challenges because at times their input are not taken on board. So the project starts and there are problems. That is why agencies, big ones like VRA, ECG, they have departments for procurement and engineering departments. They separate the two because engineering procurement is far different from normal goods procurement. And it has been something that I've been championing. If you leave the procurement officers to handle engineering procurement, there's always a challenge. They don't understand the basics. You are doing a design and build procurement and you leave it to chance. You have to get somebody trained in the field to and, uh, appreciate and interpret the conditions. Yes. Yes. Um, what I would like to know is the with the procurement plan. Is there um, a, a space for maybe like an emergency? So in case maybe an agency needs something urgently. Is it part of their plan or they have to go through uh, the Ministry of Finance to um, get it? Like if it's an emergency, something that they need, like maybe their offices burnt down and they need to uh, rebuild it. How do they go about that? How do they get funds for that? Okay, so he's talking about emergency situations. Um, how many of you were here when the former Ministry of um, Foreign Affairs caught fire. Thomas Station. Yes. So that was a typical case of okay. A typical case of an emergency procurement. So under section 40, you single source, you can single source and PPO will grant that readily for you to address any emergency situation. And even the conditions for approving, uh, for seeking approval for single source is emergency. National security considerations, they are all conditions under which you can seek approval. And for such situations, you can even start before you prepare the doc documentation. Because you can, practically you cannot just say you are waiting for documents or something. So section 40 is what allows for that. Yes, so that's a very good question. He's asking whether the procurement plans are made available to the public. Procurement plans are not secret documents. They are not secret documents. Every agency is encouraged to make available their procurement plans so that would-be suppliers and potential um, service providers can have an idea of what you intend to do for the year and then they can also prepare themselves to meet your requirements. So procurement plan like any other procurement document, should not be a secret document. Yes. So you said section 40 is triggered in the case of an emergency. So how are you... Okay. So you said section 40 is triggered in the case of an emergency. So how are you... How do you handle the cost implications? Like, um, how much the things will cost in the case of procurement? How do you handle that? Is this more speculative or is there any calculation that has already been done that we can look to? 
Okay, thank you very much. So every situation has its own peculiarity. So what he's saying is that imagine an emergency or case and you have to quickly go and single source somebody. There are times that before the application even goes, somebody is brought to the site because it is not like water leakage. You cannot say you are going to PPA for two days so the water should be leaking. Somebody is quickly brought in and then you regularize the paper. So at that point, you can only make an order of magnitude estimates. And then as you go along, prepare the documents so that you can have schedule of rates to pay. These are all things that guide us in our practice. Yeah, you know what schedule of rates are? Yeah, so schedule of rates is that you look at rates for possible items under that particular work. You agree on them. So as and when they okay, then you use that to pay. So you, you not readily know the amount exactly because of the emergency situation. Shall I proceed? So, anti tender committees, like I said, you can sit on it as a member or your work will go there. So, you should know what they do. And that is a body above the head of agency. They have a higher threshold to approve. So, they generally ensure competitiveness, fairness, and transparency of the process. Three keywords. Is there competition? Is there fairness? Is there transparency? Then the grant approval or otherwise. So if they think that everything is fine, they say, I concur. We concur for you to proceed with the award. If there's something wrong, they'll tell you what is wrong or they say they are unable to. They participate in public procurement fora. Review decisions of heads of entities in respect of complaints. So if there are complaints and head of entities do not exhaust them, the ATC can review them and take a decision. Regional review committee shall furnish the board. When I say the board here, it's the PPA board. Metropolitan municipal assemblies with reports pertaining to their operations in prescribed format. So the ATC would have to always put their reports together and give PPA. It helps to shape policy. Strictly observe principles of confidentiality and non-disclosure. This is an area that is very important for me. I always argue that the kind of profession that we practice, ethics should be one of the things that we do every year. You have to pass ethics before you are, your license is renewed. Because as a country, we have thrown confidentiality, non-disclosure, and ethics to the dogs. You know very well that you're not supposed to sit in a particular committee because you are conflicted and yet you close your eyes and sit there. You finish a meeting and then you call your friend. Oh, we went for the meeting. This man said this. It happens. It's, 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 it's not the way, but it happens. We are all guilty as professionals. Even cabinet meeting, it leaks. Are you aware? Yes. Cabinet sits and then the next minute you know what is said and somebody will tell you what somebody said. I mean, So the operational procedures and guidelines, they have to, you, when you are, you are called to sit in an ETC, you always have to agree on the frequency of meetings related to the work, workload that you have. Agree on the mode of correspondence and submission of reports from secretariat of the, to the committee members. These are things that you do. Use of technical subcommittees on goods, works, and services for efficient functioning. So there are some issues that at a certain you cannot exhaust. So you refer to a subcommittee amongst the members who, who have the capacity to deal with some particular area for them to draw down. Put in system for prompt communication to committee decisions. So we don't want a situation whereby you meet and one week later it's not out. For my 17 years stay at Ministry of Finance and Central Tender, I can say that the latest letters have been delayed is a Monday after a Thursday evening meeting. Let us always go on Friday. For any reason, if you have to delay, it's Monday. Procurement decisions should be prompt. The earlier you send, the better. Because procurement is about time. Ensure diplomacy in communicating to heads of entities. So we in the public service, we, we know this very well. Your language. You are writing to a minister. You are writing to a chief executive. Your language should be very clear and diplomatic. 
even if you find out that in the procurement proceedings there have been some unfairness, the way you put it should be very accurate to address the situation. You just don't accuse somebody when you have not established it through procedures. We encourage formal fiscal interaction with entities in addressing issues of controversy other than writing. So we try to engage. At times, when you want to write, you write and write and write, and it doesn't address anything. So at best, you call the agency to come and sit down and then go through some clarifications, and you'll be surprised that it would yield results than writing and waiting for response and writing. Co-opt persons with specialized knowledge or expertise for efficient delivery of the mandate of the committee. It's not everything that you have the expertise to do. So for instance, Central Tender, we have had to deal with um, pharmaceuticals, highly specialized IT services that you may not have the capacity. So there are times the law allows you to co-opt experts to advise you in taking decisions. You collect data from review and establish trends and observations for input in drawing up or revising policy. So if, for example, our data tells us that the trend of restricting tenders is so high. So we do less competitive tendering in this country. So PPA is informed of the figures. The numbers are scary. 70 something percent are all restricted. What are we doing to ourselves? So this data is always good to shape policy. And in reviewing decisions, we always ask for original copies of qualification information of who we have recommended. So it's not enough to just look at the um, evaluation report and say that the man has met this, he provided this. We want to inspect from his original document whether it's true. Because you and I know what people can do. They have not seen that thing, they say they have seen it. Typical stages and activities for a review in a tender evaluation report. I don't know whether I'm tempted to skip this because this is strictly for the current surveyors. So you inspect procurement plans, evidence of availability of funding. So when your documents go to the ATC, these are the things they look out for. They look whether you have a procurement plan, the activity that you are doing is captured in the procurement plan. And it's not what you submit to them all. The plans are submitted by law on the PPA website is what we look at. So we have a password to go into PPA website and see whether your activity is planned for. Do you have funding? It's not enough to write and say, there's funding for. If it's government of Ghana, I want to see commencement warrants. If it's get fund, a letter from get fund. If it is um, IGF, let's see your cash flow. These are strict things that we ask for. Confirm advertisement of the procurement plan in an acceptable newspaper. This is tricky. Did you advertise it? That's com competitive method. And there are times that we have seen people saying that I advertise in the Catholic standard, in the pioneer. You ask yourself, the law says in a newspaper of wide national circulation. So he, when somebody wants to hide a procurement activity because he wants to restrict it to some friends, so Catholic standard or the observer or whatever are not widely circulated. So the person hides under that and then you see typically they have about two or three responses showing that it is not advertised enough. For restrictive and single source procurement, confirm approval by the PPA board. So we also see whether PPA has approved. How many of you know the difference between single source and sole source? I have a prize for that if you get it correct. We use them interchangeably. Um, with single sourcing, there are a number of people who can actually be procured, but then you choose one. With the sole sourcing, the one you're procuring is the only person who can actually do whatever you want him to do. That's the difference. So for his price, I'll give him one, one question, Apo. Okay, so that's what it is. So single, you are singling out of many. So source is only one person who has that proprietary thing to do it. So our law actually spells out single sourcing. Compliance with minimum periods allow for tender preparation consistent with. So, for example, ICT says six weeks minimum preparation time. So, if you are a consultant and you are doing ICT, you go for advert and then you do three weeks. 
it comes with review, we say not adequate because the law says this is the minimum period. We look at all these things. Uh, what is happening? Okay. Okay. So these are the checklists of the things that I will leave the slides with you. The checklist of the things that a typical ETC would sit and look at. Inspect minutes, confirm, tender open records with information, carry out checks. So these are the things, if you're an ETC member, look at the things that you look out for. for submissions under section 87, that is the uh, variations. Confirm compliance of um, recommended firms, quotation with information, Confirm that the firm has duly met taxes and statutory obligations. The law is clear under Section 22 1D that before you are given a government contract, you should be tax compliant. We cannot take taxpayers' money and give you when you are not paying taxes yourself. So tax is something that we don't compromise on at all. And SNIT issues. If you don't have them complied with, there's no way you can be awarded a contract. It is grounds for disqualification from a tender. Methods of procurement appropriateness of use when do you use any of them like i said the default method is competitive so you always go competitive the other methods that you use according to how appropriate you deem them yes so how many of you have used two state tendering before or head of two state tendering you have okay Kindly educate us a bit on two-stage tendering. Okay, so the project that it was the project in question was um, a classroom block, and for this that particular one, I think the threshold was above um, what the uh, entity or what the school could do. So they had to first do a pre-qualification, and then. If after the pre-qualification, they selected it to like five contractors and then they asked them to um, tender. So I think they, they, they asked them to submit, they had a certain criteria to select their five and then based on that, they were able to ask them to now tender. Okay, so she just described pre-qualification. Pre-qualification is different from two-stage tendering. Two-stage tendering is not very popular here, but you may have a situation whereby you have to use it so for the purpose I have to explain to you. Let me give an example of a two-state tender I have done practically for you to appreciate it. So, 2012, my minister wanted to do this uh, tax stamp system. Do you know what a tax stamp is? Um, you buy a product and there's a stamp, a quality product. You see that stamp put on the laid of the bottle. Okay, so Minister Cabrado Four wanted to introduce tax stamp into this country. And he taxed us to do the procurement process. So one, tax stamp is being done by the advanced countries. When you go to Europe, a lot of countries do tax stamp. But Ghana wanted to do it and we knew we wanted a tax stamp, but we had challenges that we had to address before we could do it. So the two stages that one, you don't, yourself, you don't understand the industry, you don't understand the specifications, you don't understand the scope because you want to do tax stamp, but how to get there is difficult for you to appreciate. You cannot even define how you want to go about it. So the two stage tender addresses the situation whereby the first stage, you seek um, proposals or requests from the industry aspects to give you a solution. You get started on your problem. I want to do this tax stamp thing. Um, this is my situation. I have a porous border. I have this, this X, Y, Z. Um, I have challenges getting revenue from here, 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 here. So give me a solution. So the aspects would, in the first stage, that's the first stage of tendering, give you a proper solution. How do you intend to go about address all the problems and then get it implemented? So you evaluate 
the first stage, then it makes you understand yourself how the whole thing is. And then after evaluating the first stage and understanding the principles, you now ask them for a second stage proposal. This time, giving them a common set of certifications to um, submit a proposal on. Now you understand it. So you can now give requirements that will address your challenges adequately and then ask them. So the first stage, they submit proposal without price. First stage, they just give you a technical solution without price. Second stage, they now look at your common set of skills that you have put out there, and then they will now price it. That is two-state tendering. Second stage is based on what they submitted. Second stage is based on what you have asked them. By your understanding of the first stage, you draw up now a standard requirements that the whole have to respond to on a fair platform. You know, see, procurement is about having a fair or common platform to submit a proposal. So now I have been able to understand it. So I'm now asking you to do X, Y, Z. So respond to this on the fair platform. But the first one is just everybody bring your solution. Then you have to now understand all and draw a common platform for them to respond to. So that is two-state two tendering. I'll not bore you with all the explanation because I've explained it. Restricted tendering, section 38 is clear. The condition under which you can restrict and I think it's a bit of an abuse because if you are building a classroom, they restrict it. Small road, they restrict everything. They will take three, four names and go to PPA and get approval for. At times, some of the names that are able to seal to the approval, you wonder whether, but somehow they make it. So we should all be fighting against this thing. <coughs> so there are conditions in the law where you can have approval for restricted tendering and they make sense available from only a limited number of tenders for example if you know that um the main vehicle giants are the toyotas the sans whatever there are times you don't even open up because there are a few people who can do some particular kind of thing so you restrict it amongst them anyway and then it says if the type and cost required to examine and evaluate a large number of tenders is disproportionate to the value of the project so Maybe for some small chicken feed, one million thing, you want to open up and then you are sure that for that particular thing, you're going to get about 50 responses. The time you spend to evaluate all, so you can restrict it. So these are the conditions you write to PPA, argue, and then based on which they'll give you the approval to proceed. Select in a non-discriminatory manner a number of suppliers or contractors to ensure effective competition. Non-discriminatory manner. So most agencies have their database that they select from. So they will pick three people to do this, this particular thing. Next time they will pick. So it should be not discriminatory. But some people, procurement officers, they always pick their own favorites. Single source procurement. Anytime I get to this slide, I bleed for Ghana. We have all heard single source in the news that this project was procured under single source. You recall politically said the bus branding, all those things that were procured under single source became problematic because the tendency is that you inflate the price. It's only one person. So what the law provides, or the structure of the law, or the spirit of the law, is that PPA will grant approval for the use of the method, like they do for restraint tendering. So when they grant approval for you to use the method, you now have to ask the single source firm to submit proposals or submit a tender in response to a tender document with your requirements, right? So over the years, because of theft and clouds, what has happened is that PPA has maintained that when they give approval for single source and go and sign a contract, and that has been our problem as a country. And interestingly, approval is hereby granted for Mrs. XYZ to be single source to this project at the estimated cost of this. That's the standard letter. And they sign a contract based on estimated costs. And you will know that the application for the use of the method goes with a company profile. If you have seen typical applications, go to PPA. Company profile, he has done this work before, these are his equipment holding, these are XYZ, to show the capacity. But at the time they are asking for the approval, 
there's nothing like a proposal to show how he's going to undertake the assignment. You know, proposal that will show the methodology, how he intends to do this, how he has pride for it. It doesn't go at the time. The capacity goes, so you can assess that the person can do the job at this estimated cost. But then, when they give the approval, PPA says, go and sign a contract. So they sign a contract sometimes without standard conditions. So implementation becomes a problem, and that is what we have operated with as a country to date. So you know why the single source is always problematic? The guy has no guidelines to work with. Few procurement officers who understand the law or beyond approval granted them to use single source. They will now send a document to the single source firm that these are my requirements, standard tender documents. Give me a proposal or respond to this. They get a response, they evaluate to outline the strengths and weaknesses and then make a recommendation and even say they want to um, negotiate on the weakness identified and they think the price is not comparable to the market, then they get a firm price and sign a contract on that. So that when a contract is signed, the standard tenant document is what is used as contract for the project. Simple thing. In that particular instance, do they still need to have a tender evaluation committee just for the single source evaluation? All other things come to play. You still need people to evaluate. You see, the fact that he's been single source doesn't mean that whatever he brings you, you shouldn't evaluate. Because it cannot be 100% to address everything. He has given you that this half capacity, this is how I intend to undertake the assignment to give you results. It cannot be 100%. So tease it out. Find out what it is that he's doing, what the thing that he, he could have done better. And then address them before you sign a contract. But as the law prints now, it's like um, we've complained over the years, but the decision makers also benefit from their people being single sourced, so nobody wants to address them. Uh, I want to find out how um, technical and then financial proposal comes in this particular play. So he's jumping again, I would have come there anyway, but technical and financial proposals are for services. So if you are procuring the work, um, a services assignment, they will definitely give you a technical and a financial proposal. So like I'm saying, single source, if you are single sourcing the services of, let's say, architects, some, 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 something, you get the approval, you take the company profile and the list of jobs it has done, its capacity, establish it, and then you have give, be, been given approval to use Mrs. A to undertake the assignment. Now you ask him to, respond to your RFP, which is prepared already with all your requirements by giving you a technical and financial proposal. So you put those proposals together, seal separately in one envelope. You open technical first, you evaluate before you open financial. That's what happens. We will come to that in a bit. Please, I need a bit of understanding. Um, okay, sorry. Um, I want to find out the ETC, they are the main body that um, approves procurement from the various sectors. So like, let's take ECG, for example. They want to undertake a project. They have a procurement officer as part of their organization. So the procurement officer is the one that sets to come out with the procurement procedures, what they want to, okay, not alone, with all the other people within it. Okay, then that document they've come out with, they submit it to the ETC, for the ETC to give them approval that this uh, method you want to go about your procurement is approved, so you can start your procurement processes. Then now they go through the tendering process. If, it, if it's um, restrictive tender, they go through that source sourcing. So that's the procedure. Okay. A very good summary. So uh, this is a question online. Someone is asking the difference between procurement and tendering. Tendering is the processes that you follow through to get your procurement activity delivered. So procurement is um, the limits, you say you are buying. You are procuring the services, you are buying goods, procuring works, but 
tendering is a process, a process that you follow to achieve that. Right? Yes, madam. Um, I think um, I'm finding it hard to understand some of these things because, <laughs> because um, some of us are not um, privy to public procurement. And so um, I would ask that um, if you could mention, let's take it for example, um, a public service or um, an entity like say um, a hospital wants to procure the services or goods or something. Um, where does the Ministry of Health come in? Where does the Ministry of Finance come in? Where does the ETC come in? Where does the PPA come in? And then um, how, wh like what exactly um, are the roles they play in ensuring that at the end of the day, this hospital gains um, whatever they are procuring? Something so that I, I can really follow. Okay, thank you very much. So, public procurement authority is mandated to regulate procurement policy and issue procurement guidelines for the implementation of the law, PPA. PPA sits under Ministry of Finance. It's an agency under Ministry of Finance. The law, as we know as the public procurement law, mentions the Ministry of Finance as responsible for the law. When you read the law, anywhere you see the minister is the Ministry of Finance. So Ministry of Finance provides money to undertake procurement activities to the extent that they approve budgets and assign budget volumes to entities. Okay, so to your question, Confanochi wants to undertake a procurement. I started by saying that we have a procurement entity, a procurement head. If you are declared a procurement entity, you have the autonomy to spend by yourself. So when um, Confanochi Teaching Hospital, they have their budgets and their procurement plans have been approved. When I say approved, approved by their entity tender committee. So the, the program would be adopted and then the ETC, sorry, the procurement officer together with the other sectors will agree on the activities to be done. Then they will take it to the ETC, which is a bigger body than the head of Confanochi. ETC will approve that these are our procurement plans to be implemented for the year with a corresponding budget of X amount, which would have been approved already. Just to interject here, here the ETC, is it a part of, let's say, Confanoche, are there Confanoche representatives, or is it a whole different body? I think I mentioned that earlier. The ETC comprises members of Confanoche and external people. When you look at the ETC makeup, the law has all these things stated at the sh um, schedules. We have reps from agencies. One of the features that come uh, at the Attorney General, then three institutions of um, um, whose practice are relevant to procurement. So they normally ask for quant surveyors, some engineers as part of the ETCs. But then you have the head of entity as part of the ETC. Normally, we recommend that their finance officer is part of it. The other so they have the issue department head part of it. And they, every ETC has a composition clearly spelled out in the law. So, which means every entity has their own ETC? Every entity has its own ETC. Because when the head has to approve something beyond his threshold, he has to go to the ETC. Right. So, back to Confanoche. So, now Confanoche has a procurement plan approved, it's left with implementation. Confanoche's procurement activities has nothing to do with the Ministry of Health. Ministry of Health itself is a procurement entity. It also procures for the ministry. So that's why I'm saying that the first thing is for you to be declared a procurement entity. Otherwise, you have to work to some entity or some entity has to procure for you. Okay. Office of the President is a procurement entity. When they want to buy their cars, everything, they buy as Office of the President. They have their programs, procurement plans, everything. We inspect them, and then they follow the activities and procure the tendering process and procure. Am I right? Mm -hmm. So I think your challenge is more or less addressed. You wanted to know how Ministry of Health comes in, but I'm saying Ministry of Health, in a particular instance of a hospital, is also procuring. So you don't need a role of Ministry of Health to do a particular procurement when you have your plans approved as an entity. 
And so um, I have clarity on the role of ETC in this situation. And so um, who releases the funds for Secon Fanoshi? Or they have their own funds? So a particular entity may have sources of funding. But the major is maybe those who rely on the consolidated fund is government of Ghana. Some have some agreement with some donor people who bring the money, like Ministry of Health. They have global fund supporting them throughout the year. So when you look at their procurement plan, they will say that the funding is coming from GOG, GOG, Global Fund. So they can have sources of funding. Some of them even have IGF, internally generated funds. And that's what the universities use a lot, IGF. But, but, but the numbers that they admit, they make a lot of money. The university, you, you can see that they are doing a lot of projects. Most of them are from IGF. So depending on the source of funding, they will state that in a particular procurement plan, where the source is coming from. So it's not from just one source. But there are some agencies that only have from one source. They are very poor agencies. If government doesn't give them anything, they are stuck. Finally, what's the role of PPA? PPA is the regulatory body for procurement. One, by law, they grant approval for the use of the less competitive methods, research tendering and single source. That is one of the things they do. But the main focus of their job should not even just be granting approval for the methods. It's just on the side. But they have to be shaping procurement policy, getting, doing procurement training, getting um, data from agencies, challenges, and addressing them in revising the procurement policy, giving guidelines for practice. These are the things that PPA should be doing. I, for example, I'm a bit disappointed because something like um, evidence of access to funding. If you look at the letters that the banks write to confirm that they will support firms to undertake assignments, they will say that subject to our favorable lending criteria, it is always conditional. It doesn't really confirm. And these are things that PPA should come up with standard formats that somebody would follow. But this has never happened. The focus is more on a grant of work for the methods than any other thing. But they are supposed to be shaping policy, giving regulation, giving guidelines on public procurement. Um, based on her question about where PPA comes in, so in the same Confanoche, the ATC says it's okay. Assuming Confanoche says um, the projects we want to do, we want to use sole sourcing, then can the ATC approve or it goes beyond them and comes back? The approval for the use of single source and restrictive tendering is the sole mandate of PPA. So any agency that desires to use something other than competitive, you go to PPA, no matter where you are. PPA, even the district assemblies, you, you have to single source or restrict with approval from PPA. Your ETC doesn't give approval for the use of these methods. ETC only looks at the plan, approve the plan, and look at the implementation. We are clear. Madam, you have another question. I think, um, so then, um, essentially, PPA in, um, has no business with Confanochi approving their uh, budget or anything of that sort. They have no business with them. As long as it's not falling under single source or restrictive, they have no business with them. Okay, thank you. But PPA has general business with every entity. The way you conform to competitiveness, fairness, and transparency. So if any tenderer makes a report or a complaint, PPA under section 78 to 82, they call it administrative proceedings. They can investigate what has happened and establish um, who has created any problem and then deal with it. They have penalty that they can also apply, sanctions. So PPA, like I said, general policy guidelines and um, shipping policy or what have you. So they can easily come in any day a complaint is made to them or they can identify, you see, they have a monitoring, um, a monitoring unit who occasionally goes around entities to look into their books, how they are fed the procurement. And they, they do it ad hoc. So they can easily come and say, okay, the monitoring team is coming here. They look through your proce um, processes and see that you did this this way. If they find you culpable of any offense, they, they can establish that. So it's, it's a general thing that they have. But for particular procurement that you're undertaking and implementing, they don't have that daily business to interfere. We are good to go? You have a question I can tell. So what I want to confirm is, with all that we are discussing, we are talking about public procurement, 
But if, let's say, a private bank comes to a consultant and says they want to, let's say we are talking about buildings because we're architects and we need to, um, let's say, tender for a contractor. That has nothing to do with ETA. Of course, the, the bank and the consulting team might have their own tender evaluation team and all that, but it has nothing to do with government and all that because... That's why I shared a slide on public and private. I said, when you are in the public space, these things are necessary evils. Private sector, nobody cares. Private sector, they can even pay you cash. A private man has his money sitting at Abosu Kain. He wants to build some factory and he engages you. Who can draw a man who is carried out the amount? You don't. That is his own business. But the public issues, you, you can't just get away with anything. So the single source is a big deal for our country. Please, with the ETC, let's take Confanachi as the example they gave. Um, if it's a procurement entity, Confanachi is a procurement entity, and they have their own ETC in-house, um, they don't need to go to the district levels, the regional level ETC for approval. But if we take organizations that don't have, they are not procurement entities, that's when they go to the districts and regional levels for approval. Okay, so let me explain further. The district and regional levels have been scrapped. I think I was clear on that. That was 663. Now 14 doesn't have them. But you only go to a higher level, i.e. now the central and then the regional, depending on A to E and F. You only go there if the threshold is above that of the ETC. Let's say ETC has 2 million at their threshold. So anything beyond the head, let's say the head has 1 million, it is 2 million. If we are dealing with 1.5, the head cannot approve. So the head has to refer to the ETC to sit and approve. If it is 3 million, ETC will sit and say that 3 million is above our threshold. So we refer to central, as it were. Yes, but ETC refers to a higher body, it's not head or management. And that's section 17, the ATC, looking at a particular procurement, if it's within the threshold, approves. If it's beyond, they refer to a higher threshold body to approve. So it is the figures that will take you to the approval body. That's clear. Okay. I'm told it almost breaks. So we do price quotation. This is where all the monkey business happens. You no know, single source and could they have their own problem by price price quotation every procurement officer just gather three invoices it is very small threshold procurement stationary these things they are, but they are on daily basis you are buying tunnels you are buying this so they just gather three invoices and then look at the list and then they say oh, supply but they don't even do it properly what the law says is that you still have to write a report because you don't have to advertise price quotation, you just look at minimum three companies, but you should be seen to be giving them some document to respond to. Professionally, they just take the invoices and then look at the list, and then they say, we have recommended this. But nobody checks. You have to prepare a standard document, small document, that has requirements and ha has standards that you are supposed to meet, and even conditions if the person fails to supply. And then you send it to them. A small document that occasionally you just release, you change the date and release. And then they just look at three invoices, the list amongst them. So it is always go and bring two friends. I want to give you the supply, bring two friends. So if they keep an eye on this, there could be a lot of savings here. Because the kind of thing, it's a daily thing. They, they may look small, but the, reg, the regular nature makes it very wasteful. 44, I've thought about it, NCT. I think I mentioned that you look at it with 45 when we are doing ICT. Um, 
this is typically quantum survey. The contents in an invitation document. These are things that standard tender documents you have to go through, but I'm not sure they are meant for you. Procurement of consultants. That is very important to you. So when we come from break, we'll go through that. Thank you very much.